we will continue our discussions on uh, aerodynamics. In a previous lecture, we talked about a stream tube and we looked at the conservation of mass within the stream tube and also the conservation of momentum and energy. And we briefly looked at how it changes for a compressible flow using the first law of thermodynamics. And we also briefly talked about the second law of thermodynamics adiabatic processes, reversible processes, and isentropic processes. But we never really mathematically defined a streamline. So in this uh, series of slides, we will talk a little bit more about what are streamlines, how are they mathematically defined, and some of the related concepts such as path lines. We'll distinguish between steady and unsteady flows, and uh, rotation and vorticity and I say a little bit about the boundary layer. So that's the, what we are going to be covering in this series of slides. Mathematically, streamlines are three-dimensional. They are curves in space. They are drawn so that at every point on that curve, if you draw a tangent vector, then the tangent would be point the direction in which the instantaneous velocity vector is located. Note the word instantaneous, it means it's at any particular instance in time, at any point x, y, z. If you have a streamline at a point p, if you draw a tangent of that streamline, that'll show the velocity vector direction. In, it could be 3D or it could be 2D. Okay. In 2D, it's a little easier to visualize. So if you look at the components of the velocity vector u and v, then the slope of uh, u and v would be the velocity vector direction, and that would be tangent to the streamline. So how can we mathematically define it? So you take two points on a streamline. One point is called x, y, and z. And the neighbor point is slightly away from it, x plus delta x, y plus delta y, and z plus delta z. Now you could connect the two points with a small line vector ds which is given by dx times i plus dy times j plus dz times k. Now the velocity vector itself is defined by its three Cartesian components u, v, and w as ui plus vj plus wk. So if ds vector is pointing in the same direction as the velocity vector v, then their cross product should be zero because their included angle is zero. Therefore, the cross product will vanish. So we can do a d cross ds or ds cross v set it to zero. And from our uh, vector calculus, we, we know that you could compute it as a determinant of the uh, shown here. The first row is the three unit vectors i, j, k. The next three row, uh, next three elements are u, v, w. And the last row is dx, dy, dz. So if you evaluate the determinant, you'll get a cross product, which is still a vector. It's got an i component, and j component, and k component. And the magnitude of that vector is zero. That means the individual components should be also zero. v, dz must equal w, dy. w, dx must equal u, dz. And u, dy equal to v, dx. We can then set them, group them, and write it as dx over u, dy over v, and d, d, dw over uh, dz over w. So this is the equation of a streamline. So uh, one could, uh, if somebody knows what is u, v, w, potentially one can integrate it to find the x, y, and z. Path lines, on the other hand, are not necessarily streamlines. They are like a time exposure. So you start with a starting point somewhere in space at x, y, z, time t. Then you track a physical particle, could be a material particle like a smoke, a fluid particle. Just tra track it over a period of time and see where does it go and where does it end. So path line basically defined like an elapsed exposure over a period of time where they end up in. So it's like when you take a picture of a planet like a, or, an, or a moon, if you take an instantaneous picture, you're just going to see one dot. 
But if you have an elapsed image, you will see a line in space. That's the trajectory of the moon as it travels around the Earth, for example. Same make cars in a highway. They start at one point. They end up at another point. So the trajectory they take over a period of time is the path line that is taken by that particular particle. They are mathematically defined in a very similar manner to streamlines, except they are slightly differently. They are defined as dx over dt equal to u, dy over dt equal to v, dz over dt equal to w. So these three ODEs would be integrated, assuming that u, v, w are known. Then you can com come up with an equation of the path line. This is what happens, for example, when you track an airplane. The U, V, W are computed by onboard instruments, such as an inertial guidance system. Then once you know U, V, W, you could integrate it to get the X, Y, Z in space. This is how we keep track of aircraft, spacecraft, you know, space station. And periodically, we correct it using information, auxiliary information that is known. So, this is how astronomers also track the stars, and of course, space shuttle and satellites are tracked in this manner. So, if you now look at a picture, if you take an instantaneous picture, you're going to get a streamline. So, this is cars in various uh, um, lanes. So, if you draw a line through these cars that are lined up, uh, then you'll get the velocity uh, streamline. And the tangent to that uh, uh, streamline is simply the lane. Tangent to the streamline is the velocity vector of the car. On the other hand, if you see an exposure, exposed image, time elapsed image, you'll see the path lines. They may even crisscross each other. So somebody may come from lane number one on the rightmost lane to the leftmost lane and then cross over back to the original lane. Okay. So that's the path line. So in a steady flow, nothing changes. Cars stay in their lane. They don't move from lane to lane. Then streamlines and the path lines are going to look the same. By the way, path lines are sometimes also called streak lines. Okay. In a football analogy, this may be an instantaneous, the left lane may be an instantaneous position of where the various players are lined up, the various receivers and so forth are lined up. Okay. On the right side would be how they move about from one play of a football game to the other. They'll be crossing, crossing each other because each play looks very different from each other. Unless you happen to be a Falcons team or a Yellow Jackets team, then we execute the same play, you know, play after play after play. Then the streamlines and the path lines look about the same. We are primarily interested in steady flows in this course. There's a companion course called AE6030 where unsteady aerodynamics is covered in greater detail. So in steady flow, properties will not change from one time instance to the next. The particles will follow the same path one instant to the next. This will be like cars traveling on their assigned lane without crisscrossing or changing lane. Therefore, the path lanes and streamlines and streak lines are all one and the same. So we will primarily use the word streamline to represent the path taken by fluid particles in our course. Now we turn to a new concept called the angular velocity of the fluid. We know that solid particles can spin or rotate. The earth rotates, baseball rotates, football when you throw, if you put a spin on it, it rotates. Tennis ball, if you again hit it with a racket, sometimes it spins and moves about. How about fluid particles? Remember, we are not talking about discrete molecules. Under the concept of continuum, we are talking about a collection of particles that are closely spaced to each other. As they move from point A to point B, the position changes from X to X plus delta X, Y to Y plus delta Y, Z to Z plus delta Z. But they are not only linearly moving from point A to point B, but they are also spinning. Therefore, they have an angular velocity. Their orientation changes from time to time. Okay. So we are going to look at the angular velocity. And then uh, 
half of the angle of uh, two times the angular velocity is a vorticity. Particles can spin about the x-axis, y-axis, or z-axis. Therefore, the angular velocity will have three components. So it really is an angular velocity is a vector. Therefore, vorticity is also a vector. So this is what we're going to be covering. Vorticity is an abstract concept, but we have seen vortices. You know, these are giant uh, spinning tornadoes we see in weather maps. Sometimes we see in uh, images of a tornado season or a hurricane season or a, a during a bad storm, particles spinning about. Here we see a crop duster landing, landing. then all the uh, uh, all the chemicals or whatever is in the, in its wake gets wrapped into a one giant vortex structure caused by the tip vortex of an aircraft. So vortex is, you could think of it as a large collection of particles, lots of vorticity in it, visibly, visibly there. But vorticity does not have to be such a large collection of particles. It could be even a tiny fluid element, which is still made of zillions of particles that are spinning about. So how can we compute, how can we mathematically quantify vorticity? So let's take a solid. In the case of a solid, it's very, very easy because the solid is not deforming. It maintains its shape. Therefore, we can draw a line on any face. In this case, for example, I have drawn a magenta line. So you can now, as it moves from left to right, it's changing its position. But this magenta line is also rotating, perhaps with respect to x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, some combination of the three. So you can take a picture of it with a, say, high-speed image, you know, point A to point B. Then we can see how much this uh, magenta line has rotated in space in, with respect to the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. So you know the change in the angle divided by the time elapsed is the angular velocity about the three directions. So this works for a solid geometry. But the fluid particles are like jello because some particles are moving faster than the other. So it's not a rigid element like I have shown in here. It's a jello-like geometry. So how can we find the angular velocity of something that is deforming as it moves from left to right? So this is a particular phase of a fluid particle. At time t, it's got a phase a, b, a, c, c, d, d, b. I'm just, I have just shown one phase of a fluid element. Perpendicular plane of the paper is the z-axis. Now, as it moves from left to right, it also moves bottom to top. It also deforms. So the phase a, b has changed the a prime, b prime. The phase AC has changed to A prime, C prime. They have rotated in the different directions. AB has rotated counterclockwise. AC has rotated clockwise. So how am I going to define the angular velocity? So what we are going to do is we are going to take the angular velocity of the phase AB, angular velocity of phase AC, which are perpendicular to each other, then take an average. And since it's rotating in the plane, the angular velocity vector would be pointing perpendicular to the plane, so it will be in the k direction. It won't be along the x-axis, it won't be along the y-axis, it will be along the z-axis, which is perpendicular to the plane of the paper coming towards, the, towards you as you view this image. So we're going to take one phase at a time and see how much it rotates, find the angular velocity, then we're going to take the average. So let's take a point A, point B. It moves from left to right. It has taken a new position, A prime and B prime. We don't worry so much about the horizontal motion. It may even get stretched in the x direction slightly. But we are more worried about how much it is rotating. So we are worried about the vertical motion. So the point A has moved vertically by a distance VA times delta T where V is the vertical component of velocity in the, along the y-axis. Point B likewise has moved a distance VB times delta T and taken its new location B prime. 
So the relative vertical distance they have moved B prime relative to A is VB minus VA times delta T. Now let me look at closely A prime B prime. Originally it was uh, horizontally aligned AB. Now the B has moved vertically up to a new position B prime by a distance VB minus VA times delta T. Therefore, the angle delta theta that by which it is rotated can be found. Uh, you could think of it as a tan of delta theta is the vertical axis, which is VB minus VA times delta T, divided by the horizontal axis, delta X. So delta theta is arc tan of this quantity. Now for small instants in time, for small distances, arc tan of a quantity is that quantity itself, provided it's expressed in radians. Therefore, arc tan of the quantity is simply VB minus VA times delta T by delta X. So divide by left and right by delta T, then take a derivative. Then in S delta T goes to zero, D theta over DT, which is the derivative, equals to VB minus VA, that is the change in the velocity, vertical component of velocity, of point B, which is located at X plus delta X, minus point A, which is located at X, divided by delta X. So in the limit, that becomes a derivative dV dx. Now, this is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So according to the right-hand screw rule, the way this angular velocity is coming towards you, so it's in the positive z direction. So this is a positive quantity. How about the vertical phase AC? It is rotated clockwise, so it's going to have contribute a negative angular velocity because it's a right-hand screw rule will say this rotation will be pointing towards the plane of the paper, towards a negative z axis. Again, we could treat this vertical phase just like as we did before. If the point A has moved to the right-hand side at a distance of U times A times delta T, point C has moved U times U at point C times delta T. Because U is traveling faster than, uh, C is traveling faster than A, the excess horizontal motion is UC minus UA times delta T. The angle is, arc tan of uh, this angle is, you see uh, tan of this angle is UC minus UA times delta T by delta Y. Again, angular velocity, you can take the limit, it will produce du dy, except this is rotating in a clockwise direction, therefore this contributes a negative angular velocity. Taking the average of the two, AB rotation is counterclockwise, positive, AC is clockwise negative, then we get one half of dV dx minus du dy. So this is the angular velocity of this phase. This is in the k direction, perpendicular plane of the paper coming towards you. So we could go through the other phases in all the three directions. We can compute the angular velocity. Then you are going to get this expression for the angular velocity is one half of this quantity. The first term is what we just developed. The other two terms can be similarly be derived. You could also use uh, cyclically V will become W, U will become V, K will become I, then I will become J. Okay, so you could do it this way. Then we notice that the quantity in the square bracket is nothing more than the curl of the velocity vector del cross V. Therefore, the vorticity if you get rid of this half, two times omega is called the vorticity. It's usually given another omega symbol, or it is given sometimes the symbol zeta. For example, in Anderson textbook, they will give the symbol zeta. In some books, they will give you the uh, omega, which looks like a letter W, okay, except in Greek font. So vorticity is twice the angular velocity. So in region aerodynamics, some places you'll see a high regions of vorticity because things are changing very rapidly. The velocity gradient is very, very high. 
Remember, it's not the velocity that matters, but the, dis the amount by which it changes, therefore spatial derivative. Okay. So in the core of a jet, you may have a high velocity. It doesn't mean you have a lot of vorticity. But at the boundary of the jet, you have a high velocity of the jet interfacing with a low velocity surrounding fluid, so the velocity gradient is going to be high. Another example is boundary layer. At the edge of the boundary layer, you have high velocity. Outside, you have a high velocity, but not a lot of vorticity. But inside the boundary layer, within a short distance, velocity goes from zero meter per second to hundreds of meter per second. So you have a very high gradient, very high velocity gradient, therefore very high amount of vorticity. So, this is an example. At the edge of the boundary layer, you get a jet. You see a lot of vorticity, but not so much in the core of the jet, where the velocity gradient is relatively small. Notice that some particles are spinning in the counterclockwise direction. Some particles are spinning in the clockwise direction. Okay, Because if you look at the top edge of the jet, the bottom is moving faster, the top is moving slower, so it's more rotating in the counterclockwise direction and vice versa. Same thing in the boundary layer. Edge of the boundary layer is moving faster, and the wall particles are stuck to zero velocity. So it's like you're moving fast and you step on the chewing gum. Your foot stops, your head keeps moving, then you're going to some or small salt in the clockwise direction. So this is what happens in the boundary layer. By the way, in the boundary layer, I have shown you a laminar region where the particles are diffusing because of molecular viscosity. Then you have a turbulent flow where mixing is taking place not only due to molecular diffusion, but also the eddies that form three-dimensional currents that to carry momentum, mass, energy, temperature, species from one part of the flow to the other. So in this case, the particles will be spinning clockwise because top is moving faster than the bottom. Okay. By the way, when the aerofoil is attached, we are going to talk about the aerofoil in a later lecture. And uh, we are going to do a project using X-foil. So inside the boundary layer, which I have enlarged in this picture, by the way, this boundary layer is very, very thin. It's a millimeter thick whereas the cord is like a meter thick. So you will not be able to see the vorticity, although it's present, on the upper surface of the aerofoil, lower surface of the aerofoil, but also in the wake. You won't see a lot of vorticity in the outer region, which we are going to call it a rotational flow outside, because there the gradient is not quite so high. So where there's not a lot of gradient, you're not going to see a lot of vorticity. So we're going to call that region an irrotational flow. No rotation flow, irrotational flow. How about a stalled flow? When the aerofoil has pitched up, the flow is going to separate. Then you're going to get a very large region of separated flow. Then uh, you would see this vorticity visible to the naked eye on the upper surface. By the way, attached flow will have one type of an aerodynamic behavior. We're going to talk about it. Later on, stall flow will have a different type of an aerodynamic behavior because the aerofoil flow has separated. It's no longer following a streamlined aerofoil shape. So it's going to lose a lot of its lift. It's going to stall. And uh, this is a separated flow will also be seen sometimes over a golf ball, on a cylinder, on a bluff body then sometimes you will not be able to see, even though it's there around the boundary layer because it's very, very thin, but in the vague structure, you could visibly see this vortex structure. You will see a clockwise vortices on the upper surface, counterclockwise vortices, the blue curve, blue symbols on the lower surface. By the way, they may not be symmetric. Theodore Von Kaman found that the symmetric vortex structures are not stable so they dissociate from each other. They start shedding alternatively. Orange followed by blue, followed by orange. So you'll see an alternating pattern of clockwise vortices, counterclockwise vortices in the wake. These are, this is sometimes called a one 
Karman Vortex Street. Juan Karman is a Hungarian. He came to uh, work with uh, uh, a scientist, Prandtl, in Germany. A flow in which there is a lot of vorticity is called a rotational flow. In rotational flow, the fluid elements will rotate as they move from upstream to downstream. So this is like a bowling ball that is rolling along a bowling lane. Now we are going to derive a governing equation. We will also rederive it in a little bit later again. So how about uh, conservation of mass? So in our course, we will develop everything in 2D because it's a little easier to see, easier to visualize. Then we will write the three-dimensional version in vector form or in Cartesian form. As you know, Cartesian is not the only coordinates we could use. We could use cylindrical, spherical. We could even use a general tensor form. So where appropriate, we will write the general form without deriving them all over again. We will derive them in 2D because it's a little easier, easier to see. So I'm going to take a small control volume in the XY plane. That means X is coming from left to right. Y is going from bottom to top. Z axis, of course, is pointing towards you. Remember, we always use a right angle coordinate system. So we're going to look at a small control volume, fixed control volume, fixed in space. It's got a width delta X, height delta Y. So it's surrounded by four faces. We're going to label them phase one, two, three, and four. Left and right are one and two. Bottom and top are three and four. And their length is also shown in here. So what does the conservation of mass say? It says mass cannot be created or destroyed inside this control volume. How do we give it a mathematical phase? So let's take rho as the average density of the fluid within the control volume. Remember, it's a made of collection of particles. So some places the particles are clumped together. They have a higher density. Other places they are smaller density. But we are taking a very, very small control volume Eventually, it will be an infinitely small control volume. Delta X and delta Y will go to zero. So the mass within the control volume is density times volume. Volume is the width delta X times height delta Y times unit depth in the third direction, in the Z direction. We will normally neglect one, but we keep it for dim dimensional sake because delta X is at the units of meter. Delta Y has got a units of meter times one meter depth. Rho is kilogram per meter cubed. So when you multiply the three, you get a kilograms as a mass. The time rate of change, we are taking an ordinary partial derivative because X, Y, Z are held fixed. We are having a fixed control volume. The control volume is not moving in space. So we just need to take a time derivative because delta x, delta y, and 1 do not change with the time, we can bring it outside the derivative. You get a time derivative of 0 dt times the control volume delta x times delta y times 1. Now, this rate of change of mass is caused by perhaps more mass coming in than going out, either to the left boundary, right boundary, bottom boundary, or top boundary. So we look at the rate at which mass enters through the various boundaries, the four boundaries. So let's talk about the boundary number one that is shown here, phase one. It's got a height of delta y. It's got a length of unit, depth of one. Therefore, the area is delta y times one in meter squared. The mass flow rate is density times velocity in the x direction, u, times delta y times 1. Why did we take a x component? Because that's the component that's perpendicular to the phase 1. The y component is tangentially slithers along the side of the phase. It does not enter the control volume. That's why we took u. So rho u times delta y times 1. This is through phase number 1. This is entering. Therefore, it's going to cause an increase in the mass. Positive increase. So likewise, we could look at a phase number two. Phase number two, mass is leaving, okay? So it's leaving the control volume, so it produces negative 
again in the u, u component of velocity, same area as phase one. Bottom phase, V is entering into the control volumes. It's got to contribute positively. Top phase, V is leaving the control volume. Assuming, you know, V is in the vertical direction, then it's going to produce a negative contribution. So you get uh, four contributions from phase one, two, three, and four as shown in here. So if we divide through by delta X times delta Y, then on the right-hand side, you get this expression. Now, phase number one is at location X. Phase number two is location X plus delta X. Phase number three is the bottom phase Y. Phase number four is Y plus delta Y. From calculus, we know that when things are changing with X, if you represent them as a change divided by distance, the limit is derivative. So when you do that, you find that on the right-hand side, you have a F of X minus F of X plus delta X divided by delta X. So it'll become a negative derivative of d rho u dx. Likewise, phase number three is y, phase number four is y plus delta y, so you'll get a negative derivative of rho v with respect to y. So if you bring it over to the left side, those negatives will become plus, we get the conservation of mass. This is true for steady flow, unsteady flow, compressible or incompressible because we are allowing the density to change. This is in Cartesian coordinate system. So how do, how, what happens in incompressible flow? Rho goes away. We get just a d by dx of u plus d by dy of v equal to zero. That's in 2D. How do I generalize it to 3D? Easy. Write it in vector form del dot v equal to zero. Then del could be a three-dimensional a vector. By the way, del dot v is called the divergence of velocity vector. Del itself is called the gradient operator. And the uh, vorticity, if it is zero, del cross v is zero. These two equations are linear. So this is what we'll end up solving in our many of our problem sets in this course. Two sets of equations that are nice and linear two dimension, three dimension, in both dimensions they are linear, as long as density is constant, incompressible flow, even in steady flow or unsteady flow. So this is what we were, there we would stop with this particular module of our lecture. So we'll continue with additional lectures in our next module.